Okay, welcome to another Simple Engineering Snippet. In this video, we will be exploring dimensionless parameters and reviewing the Buckingham Pi Theorem, which is one method to uh, obtain dimensionless parameters. And uh, we will be uh, using this to derive the uh, pump affinity laws. Okay, so why are dimensionless parameters uh, of interest? Well, there are many reasons, uh, but from a very high level, uh, they will end. Use of dimensionless parameters can provide an enhanced understanding of the physics of the phenomenon that you're studying, uh, decrease the number of necessary experiments, and provide a meaningful way to correlate the experimental results. Uh, these are not unrelated, and there are certainly others, uh, but uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, what we will be doing is uh, we're going to review the Buckingham Pi Theorem, and then we're going to use it to uh, derive the pump affinity laws. And we'll provide some, uh, hopefully, some uh, helpful hints and strategies uh, to effectively derive uh, dimensionless parameters. Okay, so here's the Buckingham Pi Theorem. I'm not going to read this off, but the uh, big picture is, is that if you're doing a study and you determine that there are, uh, say, seven or eight uh, variables that are of interest, and so K would be seven, let's say, and the number of dimensions that are represented in the K variables is denoted as R, and then you can uh, reduce this down into K minus R dimensionless products or groups, sometimes also called pi groups. Okay, <clears throat> so let's do a quick review of the method. And I am going to go through this rather quickly because uh, the, uh, this should become more clear as we work through a detailed example. So the first step in my mind is to uh, select the uh, system of dimensions that you're going to be using. And the big ones are mass length and time, or force length and time. Certainly there are other dimensions, uh, but these are the big three, and that's what we're uh, going to concentrate on in this video. Next is that we identify and list all variables. Well, how do you do this? If you fully understand the problem, maybe you can do that right off the top of the head. But the reason why we're going through this is that maybe uh, we are exploring something. Well, you have to think about the physics. Maybe there's some governing equations that you can use. Uh, and in the end, uh, yeah, this is something that uh, you, your ability to do this does take some experience, and you uh, may find that you uh, list some that turn out not to be important, and maybe you miss some, and you need to go back and include that in your analysis. In the end, uh, we're going to uh, denote K as the number of variables that are identified as being important. Next is we list each of the K variables in basic dimensions. And we denote R as the number of dimensions in the K variables. Oftentimes, that will be three, uh, meaning that uh, mass, length, and time are represented in the K variables. Or if we're using FLT, uh, those three will be represented. But caution, R, the number of dimensions is not always three. I always like to give a problem on my final where there's only two. And if students have assumed there's always going to be three, well, that leads them down the incorrect path. Okay, so... The number of dimensions are represented are, uh, we're going to be uh, defining three repeating variables out of the K variables, and we're going to be using them to uh, form the dimensionless products or pi groups. And one limitation is that all the R dimensions, say it's three, must be represented in the uh, repeating variables. Now, for each of the remaining non-repeating variables, we're going to take one of them and form it as a product group with the repeating variables. And sometimes you'll call it, we'll refer to these as the pi groups. And here's an example where I've selected density, velocity, and diameter as a repeating variables. I put them to exponents, uh, alpha, bravo, and charlie, respectively. And a non-repeating uh, parameter, in this case, uh, dynamic viscosity, is formed as a product without an exponent. And the last step is, is that we solve for the exponents, in this example, alpha, bravo, and charlie, such that the entire product is dimensionless. Okay, so let's review the pump affinity laws because we're going to derive them uh, using the, the uh, Buckingham Pi theorem. And if n is rotational speed, uh, you probably recall that flow is proportional to speed, head is proportional to speed squared, and power is proportional to speed cubed. Oftentimes you'll see them written uh, these written as a uh, ratio of the speed ratio, meaning it's the same pump uh, operating at two different speeds. How does the head change? How does the flow change? How does the power change? Okay, so we're going to not use these. We're going to derive these. Uh, so let's select our basic dimensions. 
I typically always select mass length and time, and actually I think that's a decent recommendation is pick one that you like and continue to use it. It doesn't matter which one you use, uh, but uh, sometimes it's simpler to not switch back and forth. Next, we have to identify and list all the variables. And again, this uh, sometimes uh, trial and error and experience helps. There's no guarantee that you're going to get them all, and you very well may uh, include some that you turn out to not be important. Uh, so think about the physics of the problem. Um, if we're worrying about uh, pump performance, well, pump power is definitely going to be one, and we have an equation for pump power, and it is equal to the uh, flow rate times the density times the acceleration of gravity uh, times the head of the pump. And so this gives us one, two, three, uh, you know, four, possibly five uh, variables right now. So I'm going to list this off as power, flow, density. And I said four or five because... In reality, I'm going to combine the acceleration of gravity times the head of the pump. And why am I doing that? Well, head of the pump has dimensions of length, uh, and that's energy per weight. Uh, I've chosen to use a mass length time, and so I'm going to prefer to work in uh, energy per mass, and that's what the product of acceleration of gravity times the pump head gives us. Okay, also of importance could be the uh, pump diameter and the rotational speed. So we're going to start with this set, and that means that the number of variables k is equal to 6. Okay, so next step is for each of those six variables, we're going to express them in uh, dimensions, basic dimensions. And I'm not going to derive these for you, it's rather straightforward. Uh, but here they are, and just looking at the first term, power, we see that all three dimensions, mass, length, and time, are represented Therefore, the number of dimensions represented R is equal to 3. And since we have that, we need to select three repeating variables to form dimensionless groups. And again, this is a step that where experience helps. Uh, but I'm going to select uh, density, uh, diameter, and speed, rotational speed. Okay, so we're going to form three uh, pi groups or dimensionless groups. And so for each one of the remaining non-repeating variables, I am going to uh, define that as a pi group as such. So the first one is going to be volume flow rate. And my, I'm going to use my repeating variables, uh, each one, or density to the uh, alpha power, speed to the uh, Bravo power, and diameter to the Charlie power. And <laughs> expressing those in dimensions, something that we've already done. I will list it as such, and you'll notice that the non-repeating variable uh, is not taking any power, but the other ones are. Uh, doing a similar thing for the second pi group, this time using a pump head in terms of uh, uh, energy per unit mass. And again, for the last but not least, for the power of the pump. Okay, so now we have to determine uh, the exponents Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie for each of these to make everything dimensionless. So in other words, in the end, this pi group, the exponent to mass must be zero, length must be zero, and time must be zero. So we're going to go through each dimension one by one and form an equation. So starting with mass, and I look at the exponents for each of the four terms in the product, and I write those down and set it equal to zero. Okay, so here is the equation, adding a little bit of detail. Well, the first term, zero, is from the first term in the product, and there is no mass in that term, so it's zero. The second term, alpha, comes from the second term in the product, and we see mass is taken to the alpha power. And we, again, we want the exponents to add to zero, so that's where the alpha comes from. Mass does not appear in the third term or the fourth term, so that gives us one equation. Now doing a similar thing, or the same type of approach with length, uh, the first term has length cubed, so we'll get a 3. The second term, we have uh, cubic in the denominator, and it's all taken to the uh, alpha power, so we get minus 3a. Uh, third term does not have length in it, and the fourth term uh, is taken to the Charlie power, so this is our equation. Doing the same thing for time, and we get this equation where only the first and the third terms have t in it. Uh, minus 1 in the first term because it's in the denominator, uh, minus Bravo in the third term because, again, 
uh, time is in the denominator taken to the Bravo power. All right, so I got three equations, three unknowns. Do a little bit of simple algebra. Clearly, uh, alpha is going to be equal to zero. I'm going to skip the steps. Uh, but we attain that alpha, Bravo, and Charlie are equal to zero, minus one, and minus three. So now all I have to do is substitute that back into my pi group definition. And arguably we're done. Typically we will write it uh, in a more standard algebraic form. And I would, I would argue that we're not done because something that we should always do is uh, check our units. In this case it's pretty easy or see that our dimensions, I should say, uh, do all cancel out. Then this is a dimensionless parameter. All right, so now... Let's do the same thing for the second pi group. And I'm going to skip through this pretty quickly, but I should note that the three repeating variables in each of these equations, uh, when we go through this, it's going to be the same as we did for the first pi group, so forth and so on. So we really only have to make changes uh, due to the first term. The first term has no mass. So in this case, it's equal to zero. Uh, for length, it's minus two. I'm sorry, positive 2, and for time, it's a uh, minus 2. Doing the linear algebra, we get again that zero, alpha is equal to 0, and Bravo is minus 2, Charlie is minus 2. Writing that down to our definition of the pi group, second pi group, is the pump head divided by the speed squared uh, times the uh, diameter squared. And once again, we should check that the dimensions all cancel out, and in fact, they do. All right, now we're going to do the same thing for the third pi group. Uh, to keep everything uh, flowing along because it's just repeated the same. Again, we only have to look at the first term. And so only the first terms in these equations can be changed. And solving that, we get the third pi group. And once again, you know, it's a little bit more algebra. The uh, dimensions all cancel out. Okay, so these are our three pi groups, and we said we were going to uh, define the pump affinity laws, but these are not the laws that we saw earlier, but uh, they can be derived from that. And so typically you're doing the pump affinity laws for a particular pump that can be operated at different speeds. And so let's denote low speed as 1, high speed as 2. And so again, repeating, these are our pump affinity laws. And well, how do we get there is that, well, we're going to take the first pi group and set it at different speeds and equate it to each other. And so when we do that, so this is the same pump operated at different speeds and the flow is going to be changing. And since the diameters are the same, they're going to cancel out and you'll see that we obtain the first uh, pump affinity law. Then the same type of approach for the uh, pi group number two. Uh, same pump operating at different speeds, the like terms will cancel out, and we get the same, the second uh, pump affinity law that the head uh, changes as speed squared, and similar type thing for the power, where the power changes as speed cubed. All right, so is this complete? Well, these are our pump affinity laws. Pump manufacturers use them. They are very useful. Uh, are they 100% uh, sufficient for all cases well the answer is no uh, we never consider viscosity if the testing is done with water and maybe uh, if you're testing a different fluid that has a viscosity that's similar to water uh, they, they can still apply but if there's going to be a drastic change of viscosity and certainly whether you're transitioning from a a uh, non-Newtonian from a Newtonian fluid to a non-Newtonian fluid then uh, yeah that would be a concern so you'd have to repeat this with added in viscosity also note that we have one spatial dimension, the pump diameter, and maybe as you change the pump size, for example, uh, maybe the clearances don't, uh, don't uh, scale linearly. Uh, maybe there's manufacturing concerns, vibration concerns. Well, that's not going to be the change. So uh, maybe you need to bring in clearances or other spatial dimensions into it. And uh, so you would be adding in some, uh, some variables of interest, and you'd have to go back and uh, add those in and, and uh, form the additional pi groups. All right, so that shows you how to use the Buckingham Pi Theorem. And again, experience is helpful. Uh, should be aware that there are some very common dimensionless parameters, much more than I'm going to list here. Reynolds number is arguably the most common in fluid mechanics, also very common in heat transfer. 
heat transfer, uh, the Nissel number is also uh, very common. And sometimes it's good uh, if you see your uh, variables to try to uh, get groupings where these will naturally come out because historically they've been proven to be uh, quite useful. So let's look at another test case. I'm going to skip the details. And let's say we're really uh, looking at the uh, pressure drop per unit length. And we've identified uh, that variable. I'm going to lump those together as one variable. And then density, diameter, viscosity, and velocity. And whenever I see that I have density, uh, diameter, viscosity, and velocity, I will tend to select density, diameter, and velocity as my repeating variables. And why do I do that? Is because typically I'll get the Reynolds number uh, out of my as one of my dimension groups, or sometimes as the one over the dimension, the Reynolds number. So skipping the steps. This is my first pi group and second pi group. So I get one over the Reynolds number uh, for the second pi group. And that's always good to get the Reynolds number. And in fact, I like the first pi group as well because in the denominator, I have twice the uh, dynamic uh, pressure. And so that's a uh, well-known useful fluids term. And so I really like this, uh, uh, these results. And uh, I probably have a pretty good expectation they're going to be useful to help correlate uh, my data, whatever it is I'm studying. Okay, well, clearly, I could have selected something besides density, uh, diameter, and velocity. And would I get the same answers? Well, the answer is no. And in the first case, I, at the top here, it's just repeating something we've already done. But what if I had a chosen viscosity instead of density as a repeating variable? Again, I'm going to skip the steps, but uh, this would be my first uh, pi group. And, well, Reynolds number, it went over the Reynolds number, still comes out. Uh, but maybe I don't like this first pi group. It's perfectly acceptable. Uh, but uh, maybe I think that's going to be a little bit clunky to work with, and I can't relate a physical meaning to it. And so do I have to start over? Well, that is one type of thing. But I have two pi groups, and I can combine them to obtain a new one. And so I'm going to say uh, my new first pi group is going to be the product of my original pi, first pi group and second pi group. That's perfectly legal. And I go through that, and you'll see that I will obtain uh, the, uh, the first pi group that I would have obtained if I had selected density as a repeating variable instead of viscosity. Now, just a uh, side note that this is uh, when you have a taken exam, uh, the instructor is aware of this, and grading these types of problems can be quite time-consuming. So uh, to make it a little bit easier for himself or herself, uh, they may uh, pick a problem that doesn't have that many uh, variables of interest, or he may actually specify the repeating variables they want you to use just to make the grading a little bit easier. Eh, not so important to learn the subject, just uh, be aware of that. All right, well, that wraps up this conversation. I should note that... Uh, Buckingham Pi Theorem is certainly not the only way to derive dimensionless parameters. Uh, Non-dimensionalizing governing equations is very effective. Uh, the dimensional groups will come out of that and also can help you uh, to realize which terms of the governing equations uh, are not, may possibly not important. Uh, look at how we derive the uh, boundary layer equations and so forth like that. Uh, very, very useful. Uh, but I just wanted to limit ourselves on, on the Buckingham Pi uh, approach. So hope you found this useful, and I hope you have a great day.